So uh, you can write your the name of the topic over here. It is Gram Schmidt. Ortho gonalization process. Gram Schmidt orthogonalization process. Now, uh, <clears throat> to begin with, let me tell you one thing. Uh, why it is used in, in Gram Schmidt orthogonalization process, why it is used and why it is important. When I first studied in Gram Schmidt orthogonalization process uh, in linear algebra, when I was a student, I didn't find its motivation there. Uh, when I asked my teacher, he said, okay, it is a why the process of orthogonal vectors, uh, building of orthogonal vectors is important. Later, when I started doing my own research work uh, in quantum computation and quantum information, I found its motivation there. gram schmidt orthogonalization process motivation. And uh, from that viewpoint, I'm going to tell you what is why it is used, why it is so important. If you take any quantum computation or quantum computing book, you will find that in the beginning of the uh, pre, pre, uh, in, in the beginning of the book, in the prerequisite chapter, gram schmidt orthogonalization process plays a very vital role. We all know that quantum mechanics is quantum computation and quantum information is actually based on uh, quantum mechanics and computer science and mathematics. So this is a kind of subject which is the combination of all these three. Most of the cases, mathematics and computer science is used. Little bit of quantum me mechanics is required to understand quantum computation and quantum information. Now in quantum mechanics, you know that uh, I have to, before I start, I have to discuss a little bit of physics to make you understand. Now in quantum mechanics, you know that uh, the main motivation behind studying quantum mechanics was to uh, happen when uh, people, uh, so scientists found, uh, Einstein found actually that uh, a particle has two types of, uh, a, 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 in, an electron, a proton, a neutron, these micro, micro bodies have two types of characteristics. One, one, is their, one is called their particle behavior and another is called their wave behavior. So we have this wave particle duality for these micro, micro body systems. And then when they try to measure those uh, microbody system with respect to their position and momentum, they found that there appears some sort of uncertainty over there. So they measured, Heisenberg measured, measured the uncertainty and he said that he gave his famous uncertainty relation. And he said that if you try to measure X uh, direction along one uh, position of the particle along one direction, then if you try to say, for example, I, if I try to measure the position of the particle along X direction, okay, and at the same time, I try to measure the momentum of the particle along X direction, then there will be some uncertainty in the measurement of position, which is denoted by Delta X. And there will be some sort of uncertainty in the measurement of momentum. And he said that, okay, the product of these two uncertainties will always be greater than or equal to Planck's constant by two or some constant, whatever. It doesn't, uh, actually it's not important for me, but whatever constant, it should be greater than or equal to that. That means if there is, if you, what does this mean? It means that if uncertainty along, if uncertainty of in the measurement of position increases, the uncertainty of the measurement, uncertainty in the measurement of momentum will decrease. If uncertainty of the measure, um, uncertainty in the measurement of position decreases, uncertainty in the measurement of momentum will uh, increase, the vice versa. If one uncertainty decreases, another uncertainty will increase. So they are inversely proportional to one another. This doesn't happen for the particle. If the particle's momentum is measured along say this direction, P prime, P prime is measured along Y direction, and X prime is measured along, uh, and, the, and position is measured along the horizontal X direction. So then this particular thing will not happen. If it happens, if we try to measure the particle, some position, momentum, or other parameters along same direction. 
So what is this uh, x and y? This x y x and y are some sort of vectors. We can consider this as ox vector, and this we can, can consider as oy vectors. Now ox and oy vectors, these are what? These are orthogonal to one another. So if we try, if, if we can find the orthogonal vectors, if we can find orthogonal vectors and rather orthonormal vectors, then this sort of thing can be, uh, these me uh, measurements can be done very easily. We will not be having any, any sort of trouble. So therefore, orthogonal vectors actually play a very important role. Orthogonal vectors means geometrically, they mean the vectors are perpendicular to one another. And this particular, uh, process, I mean, not every vectors are orthogonal. So if we are given a set of vectors, then uh, this, can I, the question is, can I make out of these vectors, can I make the orthogonal vectors? And if it is so, then what is the process? That process is given by the mathematician, uh, the du duo named Gram and Schmidt. And therefore the process is called Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization process. So this is the motivation. Then there, there I found the motivation of studying Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization process. And because of that, fortunately, I'm able to tell you about the arena in which it is used. Maybe there are some, some other uh, research arena where Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization plays a very vital role, but I don't know personally. I can guess that in machine learning also, probably this is used, but I can, I'll not be able to say uh, actually in, in which, which particular uh, area, sub area it is used. When in seventh semester, you take the courses of machine learning and quantum com quantum computing already know. If you consider, take the course of machine learning, probably you will find that uh, in machine learning and image processing, uh, Gram-Schmidt actually plays a very vital. Com in computer science, Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization process plays a very vital role here and there. But since I, I'm not acquainted with all your uh, subtopics, I'm not uh, able to tell you in which particular uh, subtopics you will find it but you can always look for it in your different uh, subjects that you learn or you are going to learn. Okay, so with this motivation, I'm going to start this Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization process. And one another important thing that I need to tell you is that this process, the name of the process may be new to us, but the, process, the methodology that I'll be describing right now, this methodology is nothing new to us. This methodology has been has, several, has been done by us several times when we were in the school. We applied Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization process in school without knowing that actually we are applying the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization process. So I'm going to talk about that thing in my today's class. Okay, so let's begin. So first of all, let me write motivation of finding a methodology of constructing an orthogonal set of vectors, an orthogonal set of vectors. Okay. So for this, we need, we have need uh, the knowledge of the inner product space. We need the knowledge of the inner product space F and F, okay? And we know in this inner product, in this inner product space, the inner product that is defined is the standard inner product. Standard, inner product and several times I have discussed it. Okay, so this is the primary requirement. The knowledge of this is the primary requirement. Now we are going to consider a special type of inner product space, which is a special case of FNF. Say, so therefore we consider, therefore we consider R2, the set of all ordered pairs of uh, numbers or all points lying on the two dimensional plane. I am trying to visualize the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization process from two dimensional 2D geometry. So consider R2 as inner product, R2 as inner product space, 
over the field over the field r okay with respect to the standard inner product with respect to the standard inner product with respect to the standard inner product this is the first thing that I'm, we, are, we are going to do. So why have I selected this particular area? Because I need to do the process. I need to apply the process on this two dimensional plane. So therefore my, I have selected my area of area un, under area of consideration. Then once we did do this, our next job is to take a set S of two vectors, U1 and U2, which is the set, this particular set capital S containing the two vectors U1 and U2 is supposed to be linearly independent. You know a particular set is linearly independent when the vectors present in this particular set are linearly independent. So we are considering let this set S to be linearly independent. So we are writing let S be a set of two linearly independent, two linearly independent vectors, two linearly independent vectors in R2. So if it is so, the vectors U1 and U2 may look like this. So this is the vector that I'm considering. This is the vector u1 and this is the vector u2 on the two-dimensional plane on, on the whiteboard on which I'm actually working. That is a kind of two-dimensional plane. Okay. We can then say that my u1 vector will have some kind of coordinate x1 and x2, where x1 and x2 are belonging to R, and u2 will be having some kind of coordinate y1 and y2, where y1 and y2 will belong to R. Because these are the points on the, these are the vectors on the two dimensional plane. What am I supposed to find? So let me write it out. Required to find, required to find, required to find a set a set capital T containing some other vectors W1 and W2, which can be constructed from the vectors E1 and U2. W1 will and W2 will be constructed, will be constructed from U1 and U2, U2 so that such that such that w1 and w2 are orthogonal are orthogonal to each other to one another okay now <clears throat> to do this uh, and uh, to do this, what we need to do, what we need to uh, write, we can draw this particular diagram a little once again. Suppose this is my vector u1, and this is my vector u2. I'm drawing it once again. So I need to find and let us name this vector as op vector, and this vector uh, we are calling uh, angle between the two vectors. I'm uh, considering as theta. This is the angle between the two vectors. And I am doing one thing over here geometrically, just a minute. I am dropping a perpendicular from this vector. I am dropping a perpendicular from this vector on, the, on this particular horizontal axis. And let us name this particular point where it touches the Exit, uh, line is called is denoted by capital M. 
So this is my vector. These are the directions of the arrows, remember. And so we have got this figure. Okay, so OM, MP, and OP. We need to find, we need to find a vector OP prime, which is uh, which is orthogonal to the vector OM prime, OM. So if I consider, uh, just a minute, this, this, this is I'm considering as not U2, this I'm considering as U1. So if I'm considering, suppose I'm considering U1 to be my vector, which is similar to W1, then I need to find out a vector OP prime, which is orthogonal to the vector U1. And that where I'll be using the concept of some geometry and vector analysis to find it out. So what is the first, to find out the set of vectors W1 and W2, my step number one is the following. I am considering, I am considering the new vector W1 to be similar to the first vector U1 of the set capital S. This is my step number one. So I need to construct orthogonal, orthogonal set of vectors and I have a set containing two vectors, E1 and U2, from which I need to construct a vector W1 and W2. My first job in the gram schmidt orthogonalization process, my first job is to find out, uh, let's forget about the gram schmidt orthogonalization process. I'm not talking about, I'm not uttering this name right now. I need to construct two vectors which are orthogonal. So first, we, what we can do is that we can name the vector E1 as W1, we can rename this as the vector W1, and then we can draw another vector OP prime, which is perpendicular to E1, that we can do, okay? Now, you see from the, from the figure that cos theta, if I try to find out cos theta, the cos theta is what? Cos theta is OM, vector by op vector we know this so therefore this om vector is my e1 vector so om can be written as this modulus of om oh, i have to consider the mod of this magnitude of this so modulus of om is actually the modulus of the op vector multiplied by cos theta modulus of op vector multiplied by cos theta and what is op vector op vector is what is OP vector? OP vector is U2. So we get OM vector as modulus of U2 multiplied by cos theta. So we can put, give it in question number one. Okay. I hope you have taken the screenshot of this page. I'm going to the next page. So one minute, sir. Yeah, yeah. So what I have, I have done, my first trick is to, my first trick is to, consider the vector W1 in the new set capital T to be the same as Done, sir. vector, okay, the vector U1 of the old set. And now I am playing the geom geometrical rule where I am, uh, some trigonometry I'm doing right now. If the angle between the two vector is theta, then cos theta, you know, the magnitude of the OM vector by OP vector based by hypotenuse. And from there, we can write the magnitude of the OM vector is magnitude of the OP vector multiplied by cos theta, but you know that OP vector is U2 and therefore magnitude of U2 multiplied by cos theta, which is equation number one. Hello, sir. Yes. Sir, you says you told sir, W1 is equal to E1. In which sense, sir, its direction is equal or its magnitude is equal, sir? I didn't get your point. Sir, you told sir, W1 is equal to E1. Hmm. In which sense, its direction is equal. No, I am it's naming. A vector, no, 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 no. I am. I am naming. I renaming the vector u one as w one simply. Okay. I am renaming the vector. My w one is actually my w one is actually same as. Uh, in all sense, it is same as u one. I am not changing. Actually, I am not changing the vector u one at all. But I am trying to find out a vector which is orthogonal to u one. Our objective is to find the orthogonal vector. So I am just renaming the vector E1 as W1. And I am going to find out the next one where I will be uh, using the uh, 
uh, geometry of u2 and u1 vector together understood yes sir okay now we know oh, sorry we know that the vector u1 if i consider the dot product of these two vectors it is same as mod of u1 into mod of u2 multiplied by cos theta and this implies that cos theta is equal to u1 dot u2 multi divided by mod of u1 into mod of u2 okay now from equation one from equation one we can simply write the om vector as we can write the om vector as what is my om vector my om vector is mod of u2 into cos theta so we can substitute the value of cos theta over here so we can write it as u1 dot u2 divided by mod of u1 into mod of u2 and from there we get u1 dot u2 divided by mod of u1 this is what this is my om vector magnitude of the om vector now if we consider eu vector be the unit vector unit vector along the direction along the direction of u1 then then we can write this vector om we can write this vector om as u1 dot u2 divided by mod of u1 multiplied by u u eu vector because you know that if i have a vector x we can always write this vector x uh, if i consider its uh, coordinates x1 x2 x1 x y z x1 y1 x x1 x2 x3 you can always write it as x1 y i x2 j uh, x3 k like this so i am not considering other directions i am only considering its direction along the vector i set so here my i here my i vector is being named as eu vector okay because i am doing it in general sense so i am not naming it as i vector i am naming it as some vector eu which is the unit vector along the direction of u1 only so i am only interested about the vector in the direction of u1 i am not interested in other directions so we have we can write it in this manner and you know that unit vectors can always be represented as we can write if eu is the unit vector along the direction of u1 so we can always write it as u1 divided by mod of u1 okay and from there we can see that my om vector is similar to u1 vector dot u2 vector divided by mod mod of u1 vector square multiplied by u1 so this part we have got over here this what we have got over here okay now what is this if you can recall this is nothing but the orthogonal projection of u2 along u1 now i am stopping here right now because my time is almost over i am going to continue in the next next session join again and i am going to continue from here just quickly take the screenshot